So today's topic is basically first trimester ultrasound in the emergency department. Um, I suppose it's something that you could kind of run across up in the, the units, uh, but that would be kind of a, a really rare scenario, I suppose. Um, but first trimester ultrasound in the ED, um, the title of today is, Can You See Me Now? Right? We'll see where that comes into play here in a little bit. But as we get started, I always like to open up with a case so we can kind of think through, hmm, you know, what are the different scenarios that we might see ourselves in? We can really visualize that and picture that in our head about how we want to, um, or what we might be seeing in the department, and that will kind of set the stage for, for talking about the rest of the, the presentation today. So today we're going to talk, you know, think about yourself, you know, in the department talking uh, with a patient, he's a 24-year-old female, presents with lower abdominal cramping, um, and says, hey, I'm approximately eight weeks by my last menstrual period, right? About two months ago, you know, my last period was I missed it by a handful of weeks. Oh yeah, I took a home pregnancy test. It's positive. And now I'm concerned about this cramping thing because I didn't think that was supposed to happen, right? So that really kind of sets the stage for a whole host of things. Um, but when we go in with the scan, we go into the ultrasound, we can find really a number of things, right? And so one of the things you may actually find is something that looks like this, right? And so here's an example of an IUP, right? An intrauterine pregnancy. And you can see this one's pretty well advanced into the first trimester. You definitely see a head, you can see an arm waving there, a little bit of legs kicking in and out. Uh, and this is a pretty advanced first trimester ultrasound. Uh, and it's certainly not unreasonable for someone who says, hey, I'm eight weeks by dates to kind of get their dates off a little bit, um, which is you know one of the reasons why we do ultrasound. Um, but you could see something like this. Now contrast that, right? Same presentation, 24 female comes in with abdominal cramping, says I'm about eight weeks along. And you see this, right? What do we have here? So here is basically the bladder. You can see that on the right hand, like upper right hand um, you know, part of that sector. That's the anechoic bladder. And then just, you know, I guess cephalad and posterior to the bladder, we're going to see the uterus, right? And inside the uterus is an empty sac, right? Or at least it seems empty. I don't know. Um, but it's definitely an anechoic, maybe some reverberation artifact in there giving it some echogenicity, but it's a decently anechoic sac inside the uterus. Uh, and I don't see a baby. Right. And so you're saying, hey, man, I'm eight weeks along. I should hopefully see something. Um, but what's going on here? You know, and it's not unreasonable, like I said, for patients' dates to be somewhat off uh, to say, hey, I'm eight weeks, but actually they're six weeks or eight weeks. I'm actually 10 weeks. You know, it's, it's certainly not unreasonable, um, but I should be seeing something at some point. And what I can say about the study is hmm, I don't see an IUP yet, but I see a gestational sac. Right. It's in the right place. Um, I see maybe that double decidual sign. We'll chat about that in a little bit. You know, is this good enough? Is it not? Do I need to move on? Do I need to, to, to get more information? Uh, certainly some, one of the head scratchers that we may find ourselves in, you know, as we're plowing through this stuff in the emergency department, right? Uh, so these are two potential different scenarios out of the same case. And I think what it does is it nicely opens up today's topic of conversation, right? And so today we're going to be talking about doing first trimester ultrasound in the ED and not necessarily a, a whole comprehensive, here's all the different things you need to know about a first trimester scan in terms of where you put your machine and where you stand and how you get your images and what windows do you need and what's the protocol and what are the different findings and all the different complications and pitfalls. Like that would be a topic, a really an expanded topic for a much longer conversation than we're going to have today. But today, if we want to zero in and kind of outline it in your head, I want to answer three questions or, or discuss three topics, right? Number one is why first trimester ultrasound? Like, why do we bother doing this, right? Why do we do ultrasound the first trimester? Is this someone we can just send out without, you know, why, right? Second question we're going to answer or talk about today is how do we do it? Like, what's the basic first trimester ultrasound? You know, the, the core things that we want to identify when we're doing a first trimester ultrasound, right? And finally, we're going to discuss strategies or specifically one strategy um, that will help us visualizing those really challenging early first trimester pregnancies, right? And so those are, that's going to be the outline of today, kind of what we're going to talk about. So with that being said, let's dive right on into it and really get into the, you know, the, the substance for today. So first question, why bother doing first trimester ultrasound, right? And so if you think about it, kind of back up big picture, kind of Let's get our brain off the ultrasound for just a minute and think about pregnancy in general, right? Uh, the first trimester is a really, really crazy busy time in the life of, you know, not only the, the, the baby, but also in the life of mom, right? There's a lot going on. I mean, first off, you just got news that your life is dramatically going to change, right? And um, 
having been through this four times now already, uh, each one is is exciting, right? Uh, and it's a dramatic change uh, that's gonna ch that's gonna happen in the life of our family uh, as we now have, are introducing a new life into the world and kind of all the implications that means for the next rest of my life, essentially. Um, but there's a lot going on there. But there's also a lot going on with mom, right? So there's a lot of hormonal changes that are happening. Um, mom's going to be maybe feeling not so hot, being tired, fatigued, you know, having some morning sickness, things like that. It's just gonna be a busy time with mom as kind of she's adjusting to having this new life growing inside of her, right? And then if you think about it from the baby's perspective, I mean, this is the, the really pivotal part of fetal development. And I'm, I suppose an obstetrician would probably argue with me on this one, like every single part is very pivotal. But think about it, right? From embryologic perspective, you're going from uh, essentially two zygotes to one cell, right? You're going to divide that cell into two to four to, you know, eight to, you know, keep going. Um, that's going to start developing those cavities, going to start forming the three different layers, the three other different layers are going to fold, they're going to curl up on each other. And all of a sudden, from that one cell, right, to the three layers, to the folded up cannoli, as it were, right, we're going to turn into a baby, right, we're gonna have one tube that's going to turn into all the different fetal parts. Uh, and by really the end of the first trimester, all of it's there right? We're going to have all of the rudimentary parts. And then the rest of the pregnancy, it's growing, developing, maturing, and getting bigger, right? So it's a lot going on in baby development, really in those, those critical first six, eight, 10, 12, 14 weeks, right? And so as all that's happening, right, there's a number of things that we need to think about, need to consider in the emergency department uh, for ED related pregnancy emergencies um, as these patients come to the department, right? So I really was, as I was thinking about it this morning, just kind of jotting this down, I really can divide this in my head into like three basic categories. So things that we need to worry about in the emergency department, right? And those are gonna be um, basically, where's the pregnancy, right? What's pregnancy location? Number two, what's the pregnancy viability? Right. Number three, are there any pregnancy related complications? So if we take those in turn, right, pregnancy location, obviously the most compatible with having a smiling, healthy or healthy eating, you know, drinking, peeing, pooping, sleeping baby in nine months is to have a baby in the uterus, right? An intrauterine pregnancy. That's just, that's the way it was designed to work, right? So you have, we, we want to identify that, that pregnancy is in the uterus, but we know that complications can arise, that baby can implant elsewhere, right? You can have ectopics of various different flavors, whether it be an ovarian ectopic, a tubal ectopic, an interstitial ectopic, a cervical ectopic, an abdominal ectopic, and we can probably keep going. Um, but one of the critical things that we need to identify, right, is where is baby, right? While most babies are intrauterine, right? Most of them make it to where they need to be, uh, there is a, a high enough rate of ectopic pregnancies that we need to be concerned about. Uh, that is something that's on our radar in the emergency department. And I read a study uh, from the New England Journal, I think it was New England Journal, a handful of years ago, saying that that women who presented to the emergency department with first trimester in the first trimester with first trimester related complications, you know, vaginal bleeding or abdominal pain, um, the rate of ectopic was about 10%. And to me, that number seems high, right? I, I just, I can't see 10% of my patients uh, in the first trimester having ectopic pregnancies. Um, but I think what it illustrates is that it's a high enough risk that we need to be concerned about it, right? And we need to identify where this baby is in the first trimester, right? So that's number one, pregnancy location. Where is the thing, right? Can we find it? Number two is pregnancy viability, right? Um, and this really answers the question that all really moms are concerned about as they're coming into the department with first trimester complications is, is this a miscarriage, right? Am I gonna have a smiling, smiley, healthy baby in nine months or is this something that's going to develop into a miscarriage? And that's these, these are early findings or, or signs of that miscarriage, right? Uh, and so certainly something we want to assess as we're working our patients up clinically, what, is they, what do they present with? And even sonographically, does this, does this baby show evidence that it has, um, has, it is alive, essentially? Is it moving? Is there cardiac activity? And what are the parameters of saying, hey, this is just too early to tell, or no, this baby developed beyond a certain point where I should be seeing some, you know, some evidence of life, 
and this is therefore a, a, a demise pregnancy or a miscarriage. And if you want to learn more about that, just check out our YouTube channel. Um, and we have a, a lecture about that. You know, what are the signs, uh, sonographic signs of, of pregnancy failure, right? So that's, that's really question number two. And the one that really brings a lot of angst to the patient as they present to the emergency department is, you know, is this a miscarriage? You know, do I need to deal with that and all the complications, you know, emotionally and physically with that? Or is this still a viable pregnancy, right? And then number three, and this is really a broad category, but complications, right? Um, are there things that we can see, that we can detect, that we can pick up clinically, with sonographically, by labs, whatever, that may suggest that this pregnancy is going to be not the straightforward, typical normal, right? Um, so either it's going to be an abnormal developing pregnancy. So we're talking about a genetic disorder, like a trisomy, things like that, which not really in our wheelhouse. Uh, that's something that the OB docs are going to worry about with further, in, further imaging and testing down the line. But something that may be of importance to us is, hmm, I can't find that IUP, that definitive baby, you know, but something looks weird, right? Is this a molar pregnancy? Um, another consideration is, is this a heterotopic pregnancy? Like you talk about the risk of heterotopics being pretty low in the general average population, but as we see patients who have enhanced um, fertility, so they've gone to get IVF or they're getting fertility enhancing medications to really help work through some of those infertility issues, that risk of heterotopic goes way up to the point that we actually have to worry about it. So do they have a, pre a pregnancy in the uterus as well as outside the uterus? And even another uh, complication that, you know, I hate to say it's complication, um, but the fact that, you know, it, it can affect pregnancies is, do you have twins or triplets? You know, like how many pregnancies are there? Um, and I know every single time that my, that, um, that we've been expecting that my wife has been pregnant and I've scanned the, you know, for the first time uh, in each pregnancy, I put the probe down and it's like, oh boy, here we go. Is this a single pregnancy or is this twin pregnancy? Just kind of gearing up for what's coming. And uh, they've all been single so far. Um, but that's one thing that, you know, can potentially add complications to a pregnancy or at least needs to be managed uh, in a little bit more careful fashion. Um, and it's helpful to know early on, right? So those are the three considerations that we have in the ED. Where is the thing? Is it viable? And are there any potential complications that we need to, to sort through, wade through, or know about as we're kind of progressing through the ED care and then the early stages of their prenatal care. Um, now, in this topic of first trimester considerations, why scan? I think we need to bring up that whole idea of the HCG, right? The discriminatory zone. And I've talked about this in other lectures that we've got posted. Uh, check out the YouTube feed uh, for those. But I think a little bit of uh, conversation here is worth uh, worthwhile um, saying the HCG is commonly used as an indicator to say, is something really going on with this pregnancy, right? Uh, is there a problem with this pregnancy? You know, is and, and typically in in normal fashion, the HCG will rise. You know, every 24 hours, I think was it doubles every 24 hours in early pregnancy. Uh, and so, if you draw an HCG now, right, and if you bring them back in a couple of days and draw it again, and it's gone up a substantial degree, that really suggests a pretty normal pregnancy. With the thought being, if it goes up poorly, right? If it doesn't go up as much as you'd expect, or maybe even goes down, that would suggest a potential miscarriage or like an ectopic pregnancy. And so what we see here in this graph, and this was published in the New England Journal, I think it was 2014, there's an article about ectopic pregnancies, a really good review article. Um, but this was published, and it basically shows, it graphs kind of the HCG levels um, in their change over two days, and then what the outcome of that pregnancy was, right? So at the top, you see just normal intrauterine pregnancy. So if you have a, a level of, you know, X at time zero, and it changes by X percent, right? So let's say it changes by, you know, 75% by day two, that's in the blue zone, the intrauterine pregnancy zone, and it's, it's suggesting normal pregnancy, right? And most people are going to fall in this pattern. Um, if it rises only maybe, let's say, 10%, well, that falls into the ectopic pregnancy zone. You have to be worried about that. And then obviously, if it falls by, let's say, 50% over you know, day two, then you have to be worried about, well, is this evidence of a miscarriage? The This is helpful, right? But the problem with this is there's way too much overlap between normal and ectopic and ectopic and, and miscarriage. Um, and so it, it really becomes muddy, right? If you get one and then the other one's kind of in the equivocal zone, we really don't know quite how to deal with this and quite what to do with it. And so, 
we have to then add further diagnostic workup to really understand what's going on with this patient. And this is really where ultrasound enters, right? And this is why we take the ultrasound to the bedside and scan these patients and say, okay, what exactly is going on with your pregnancy, right? We have a timestamp, right? You said you're eight weeks. If we reference back to that patient at the beginning, you're eight weeks. We think you're going to be somewhere around there. Now let's really just put plant that flag sonographically and say, okay, Number one, where's the location? We found it. It's in the uterus. Number two, is the baby alive? Yes, we have a heartbeat. Number three, is there anything else that we see that could be potentially problematic uh, in the emergency department in early few days after um, until you can see the OB, OB doctors, right? And so that's where really the benefit and the the um, the the practicality of the ultrasound comes in. And so with that being said, let's talk a little bit about the basics of first trimester ultrasound, kind of the things that we're gonna be looking for in the first trimester. And that really will help us uh, identify some strategies, you know, on these more difficult cases down the road that we'll talk about in point three. So the goal for first trimester ultrasound is really to identify the presence of an intrauterine pregnancy, right? That's, that's it. If I can find baby, I'm good in the department, right? Now, this doesn't mean that that's all that needs to be known about said baby, right? And the OB doctors are gonna certainly do a lot more things. Um, and one of the things that we'll be doing, you know, for example, that we don't do is measuring nuchal thickness, uh, a nuchal translucency th thickness, right? That's one of the things that they help do to risk stratify patients for genetic anomalies, right? But again, that's beyond what we really need to know. Like, I don't need to know if they have a trisomy in the ED. I just need to know is it where it's supposed to be? Is the baby alive? And can I make them, can it get them to follow up in, in a couple of days with OB, right? And so we want to identify where is baby, right? Is this thing an IUP? And statistically speaking, for most people who aren't having some form of fertility enhancing um, therapy to really to deal with infertility, the likelihood of having an ectopic pregnancy when you've identified a, an intrauterine pregnancy is really pretty low, right? The heterotopic risks range somewhere in the order of one to 30,000 to one to, I don't know, 7,000 or so is, uh, based on whatever studies you, you want to pull up. So it's pretty low. It's less than a fraction of a percent risk of a heterotopic pregnancy if you identify that intrauterine pregnancy. So that's our main goal, right? And then our secondary goal is to screen for potential complications in the first trimester, right? So with that said, the normal progression of ultrasound, it's helpful to understand this normal progression uh, of ultrasound so that we can kind of piece the patient into kind of this pattern or this framework that we've set up mentally to understand where they're at, right? So early on in pregnancy, um, patients progress at a relatively consistent rate, right? Um, so generally what you'll see is around the five week mark, you'll see the development of a gestational sac, right? With that double decidual sign. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, in about five and a half weeks or at about five and a half weeks, they'll start developing that yolk sac. You'll see that yolk sac um, has developed. And about six weeks is when you start seeing the fetal pole, at least sonographically, right? And all these findings are decently consistent from patient to patient early on in pregnancy. In fact, uh, I was reading something in preparation for a couple of weeks from now, and just a little bit of a, a sneak peek. Early in pregnancy, the the delta, right, the plus or minus couple of days on some of these dating methods is about half a week, right, three to four days. Uh, so this is going to be the most consistent consistent thing that you're going to see kind of developing early in pregnancy. Uh, as the baby gets older, other metrics of fetal dating are going to become less and less consistent with one another uh, based on based on this gestational age. So the first thing you'll see is kind of that gestational sac to develop into the yolk sac to develop into the fetal pole. So if we focus in on that gestational sac, right, this is going to be early on in pregnancy, likely five, six weeks range. Uh, and you'll see that anechoic sac inside the uterus, and you should see it in the uterine fundus, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to see it down in the cervix. I don't want to see it in the lower segment. I want to see it in the uterine fundus, because that's really the part of the uterus that's designed to accept the baby, designed to have the growth and development, and really designed to be that, that home for the baby for the next nine months, right? Um, and what you'll oftentimes see is what's described as the double decidual sign. And there's some literature that came out, came out a year, years ago that said, hey, if you see this double, double decidual sign, this is suggestive of an intrauterine pregnancy, right? And while it may be, right, extreme amounts of caution is always delivered when you rely primarily on the double decidual sign to the point that the general teaching for ultrasound is that the first reliable finding of pregnancy is not the double decidual sign, it's coming up next, right? But since we're here, you basically see these two rings surrounding that gestational sac. And you can see it, I pointed them out with the arrows here. And one is the decid decidual capsularis, right? And that's the really the capsule uh, surrounding that gestational sac, right? And then the second one is decidual parietalis, 
uh, parietalis, yeah, uh, which is basically the lining of the uterine cavity, right? The that lining that that gestational sac, the baby's going to kind of burrow and implant into. Uh, and so that's the double decidual sign in the early stages of pregnancy. So you can see it in normal pregnancies, but it's not yet enough of a reliable indicator to say this is definitely a pregnancy. So we got to move on. We got to find other things, right? And that brings us to the next thing, and that's the yolk sac, right? And this is, and I'm going to emphasize this here, this is the first definitive, reliable finding of intrauterine pregnancy, uh, sonographically speaking, right? And this is what you're looking for. We don't want to see uh, anything less. We want to see this to claim and call it as an intrauterine pregnancy, right? Uh, so this is what we're looking for. The yolk sac itself is kind of this little sac that's uh, the area where the, the nourishment or the nutrients for the developing fetus is stored. It's also where the hematic poetic uh, functions of the fetus happen. Um, and we see this kind of grow and develop from about five weeks of, uh, of gestational age all the way up to about 10 weeks of gestational age. Uh, and then as you get towards the end of the first trimester and into the second trimester, the gestational sac really you know, becomes less and less detectable to the point where we're really not looking for it. Uh, so it's really a, a key finding early on in pregnancy. And it appears sonographically as this small little ring, right? Some describe it as a Cheerio, um, but you can see it as a small little ring that's inside that gestational sac. And this is what we want to look for. Again, emphasizing it. This is the first definitive sign of intrauterine pregnancy, right? Now, moving on, obviously things are going to grow and develop from there. And so the next thing that we want to look for is the fetal pole, right? And this is uh, really the the development of that that I guess you can call it embryo prior to eight weeks, and then fetus, you know, after eight weeks. You want to keep uh, consistent with the nomenclature. Uh, and so early on, like that top left example here, you can see a really really small thing. It looks like a grain of rice uh, that is going to be adjacent to the yolk sac, right? Um, and this is going to be the fetal pole. And we can oftentimes see these for a skilled sonographer with a good machine and a um, and an ideal patient, you can see these things down into the six week mark, um, you know, and really where you're just seeing this tiny grain of rice with a little flicker of a heartbeat, right? Um, and so that's the earliest finding um, where you actually see the baby, right? Uh, moving on top right, you can see something that's a little farther along eight weeks, right? And then the bottom middle is going to be somewhere that's going to be a little bit further on probably about the 10 week mark. Uh, I don't remember exactly how far along that one was. But what you'll see is that normal feel, the normal progression of the fetus, where it goes from what looks like a grain of rice, right, to something that's now looking like a gummy bear, right, in the eight weeks, where you're starting to sprout the arms and the legs, and you can see a little bit of the definitive head, to around that 10, 11, 12 week mark, where you're having more distinctive features of a head and neck and arms and legs that move, more of a torso uh, that's looking like just a miniature version of its future self when it comes out, you know, I guess nine months minus. 10, 12 weeks later, right? So that's going to be the, the next thing that we're going to see. And we're going to want to look for and identify that intrauterine um, fetal pole uh, in, inside, the, inside the belly, right? So the, the next thing that we want to look for uh, as we're kind of marching through this exam, right? And obviously what goes without saying is the technique is we want to scan the patient in the sagittal orientation, sweep all the way through the uterus, scan in the, the transverse orientation, sweep up and down. We really want to see this in two orthogonal planes to verify that it's intrauterine. But once you've seen the intrauterine part, this is kind of what we're looking for. And so we've seen the fetal pole. And then to answer the, to answer the second question, right? We've already answered the first question of, is this thing located where it ought to be. The next question is how far along is this thing viable, right? And so we can measure a crown rump length. We can get a gestational age assessment or estimation based on the geometry uh, or the size of this baby, right? And this is the most accurate method of dating um, a baby kind of in, in utero, right? As you look through, and we'll look at this in a couple of weeks, as you look through all the different methods of dating, everything else becomes less and less accurate as you move further along in the pregnancy. Um, so this is really where we're going to want to plant the flag and say, this is how far along the baby is. Because the OB docs are going to basically assess or estimate the, you know, the date of delivery, the EDD, based on the dates of the patient, if those dates are reliable, and to the extent that they're not, then they're going to really rely on the early first trimester dating with the crown rump length uh, to really say this is how far along that baby is to es estimate kind of when delivery date is and kind of make all our calculations after that, right? Uh, so if you measure from the top of the head to the bottom of the torso, excluding arms and legs, uh, and excluding the yolk sac, that distance can be plugged into a formula in this situation on this computer, uh, it's the Hadlock formula, and that's going to spit out a gestational age 
uh, in weeks and days, right? And so in this situation, 1.89 centimeters correlates with an eight week, two day pregnancy, right? And so it's a way of getting an estimate of how far along said baby is. And then the question you can ask yourself clinically is, does this fit? And is this consistent with one's dates, right? So if you said, hey, I'm about seven weeks and I'm measuring an eight weeker, that sounds good, right? I'm, I'm cool with that. If you say, I'm measuring, they're like, I'm, uh, you know, I think I'm 12 weeks along, right? And you measure a seven weeker, well, you have a five week discrepancy you got to explain, right? And so either the patient's really off of their dates and you need to probably dig into that with them, or something's dramatically abnormal with this pregnancy, right? And so it's something we can use clinically to really assess kind of where we are. Right. And the final thing um, to assess for the baby in particular is what's the heart rate. Right. And so, as we know, the fetal heart rate develops or at least starts uh, becoming visualized around six weeks of gestational age. Right. So when we measure that fetal pulse, about six weeks and we can see that that rudimentary cardiac tube, right, the, the aorta, the heart portion, begin to have automaticity and start beating, right? And then we know that over the course of the next you know, handful of weeks, that tube's going to rotate, wrap, and develop into the four chambers of the heart. Um, but we can start detecting that fetal cardiac activity, that independent autonomous um, uh, cardiac activity with our ultrasound machine. And because we don't want to add additional power inputs or energy inputs into the patient, we really prioritize doing M mode for our cardiac out, our cardiac assessment rather than Doppler mode uh, to see kind of what that fetal heart rate is. But if you look, put the M mode caliper right through the fetal heart, turn the thing on, right? You'll see these little blips on the M mode tracing that correlate with that level, that depth level of the fetal heart. Uh, and the machine has a calculator where it can say, these are this many, you know, milliseconds apart. I can then tell you how rapidly that heart's beating. And so our machine here, uh, it does it every other beat assessment. Some machines, it's every beat assessment. You kind of got to know what your machine does, uh, but it can give you an estimate for that fetal heart rate and really can be used clinically to say, hey, you know what? This patient has a fetal heart rate that's within normal parameters. Generally, I use uh, about 100 to 180 as my normal parameters in pregnancy. Uh, and it's it's obviously present um, in a, in a well enough developed fetus to say, okay, this is a viable pregnancy. And when you don't have the fetal heart rate, you have to ask yourself, am I too early or is this evidence of a fetal demise and really plug that in uh, and correlate that clinically. And if you want more on that, uh, check out the YouTube channel. There's a video on that uh, about how you assess for, um, for pregnancy failure using ultrasound, right? So that's kind of the final thing that we use to assess in the first trimester protocol, the fetus itself. One other thing that you need to know, kind of particularly relating to mom is, is there any free fluid? Right. And this is going to really point towards that question of do we have an ectopic pregnancy? Right. And it's not abnormal to have a trace amount of, of fluid uh, in the pelvis. Right. It's called physiologic fluid. Uh, we oftentimes see that. And it's de definitely depicted here in this image. Right. But as that amount of fluid grows and gets larger, your concern for ectopic has to grow, especially in the context of when you don't see an intrauterine pregnancy. Right. Uh, if you see the IUP and you have fluid, you, you know, lots of fluid, you have to explain that. Um, but you may see a trace amount of free fluid, particularly in your endocavitary scans. Um, in your transabdominal scans, it's less likely visualized. And so, um, you know, it's just something to look for uh, to, see, to see if it's there. Uh, but that's kind of the last thing that we want to assess for as we're scanning through these patients, say, do we have normal looking baby in the right place with good you know, biometrics? And then is there free fluid kind of in the pelvis and then extending up into the abdomen? So that's a little bit of how we do the first trimester. All of that is kind of preparatory work to bring us to point number three and say, what happens if you can't see that, right? What happens if you get in, right? And you really, really can't see much of anything. Uh, maybe you see a gestational sac, but you really don't see anything inside that sac. And I want to know a little bit more detail about the patient, right? So traditionally, the way this is done, right, is they do an endocavitary study. Um, in our shop, it's oftentimes in radiology, right? Where they use the transvaginal ultrasound probe, get right up against that cervix and get that inside view, which shows quite a crisp and clear view of, of the uterine cavity. Um, and in this situation, you see that gestational sac with a yolk sac, right? And the nice thing here is that it gets underneath all of that bowel gas um, and really gets you right up close and gives you a, a much more high resolution image uh, of, of what's going on inside that, that uterine cavity. The problem is, right, this may not be available to you when the patient's in the department, right? EDs are notorious for being 24 seven departments, right? It's one thing I've discovered over my time working in the department is I tend to work night shifts from time to time. 
And so I'm here, the patient's here, but my sonologist may not be here. My sonographer may not be here, right? And so in one of the places where I work, the sonographer doesn't work overnight. In another place where I work, they're here overnight. So uh, I, in one place, I don't have access to overnight endocavitary probes or endocavitary ultrasound. In one place, I do, right? And then in the point of care world, you know, endocavitary ultrasound is certainly within the wheelhouse of point of care or emergency ultrasound or OB ultrasound, but it's not necessarily available to all places. I know I've got friends uh, in the community that don't have an endocavitary probe, right? Uh, or don't have the privileging and training to be able to do the endocavitary exam, right? And so these are definitely um, hurdles that you may encounter as you're trying to scan the patients and trying to provide patient care to be able to provide this level of image and this level of specificity in your studies. And we'll talk more about this endocavitary imaging next week. But when you don't have that, now what do you do, right? Especially at two in the morning when your patient's there, do you hold them overnight? And I remember we used to, right? When we didn't have overnight um, uh, scanning coverage, we used to hold them in the ED overnight and then scan them first thing in the morning and send them home. And with increasing levels of patients and boarding and and uh, all that stuff, that's less than an ideal scen uh, scenario and workflow. Uh, and so we need to have a different scenario, right? And so the question is, what do I do with this scan, right? When you see that there's a just a potential gestational sac, we're not going to claim it as a official gestational sac until we see something in it, right? But it's a potential gestational sac. Everything looks decently normal, but I haven't confirmed that there's an IUP here. And maybe they got a little bit of vaginal bleeding to kind of throw in the mix just to kind of raise the stakes. What do you do in these situations to determine that this is um, a normal pregnancy or a, a concerning pregnancy? And this is where the strategy that I would offer you to today, and we're going to talk about for the rest of the time here, is transitioning from the curvilinear transducer, notice we're using the curvilinear transducer, to the linear transducer, right? And the advantage that the linear transducer gives you is that it is a higher frequency transducer, meaning that it's gonna be a higher resolution transducer, and it's gonna allow you to see things in a little bit more detail. Now, what you sacrifice in exchange for that resolution is depth, right? You're not gonna be able to penetrate as deeply into the patient as you would with the curvilinear transducer, right? But here's an example uh, of using the linear transducer to really pull out that, that yolk sac. Uh, and we can even get a fetal pull off of that in our pa in a patient with um, early first trimester complications, right? So on the left here, you see the linear transducer looking at the uterus and that gestational sac. And inside that, you can see the little, little yolk sac. On the far right, you can see the pregnancy measures out at about six weeks, one day. And then we can even get a fetal heart rate of, I think I can't see it too small, 126 beats per minute. Uh, on this this particular baby. And now by doing this, all of a sudden, I have taken a, ch a technically challenging study because I couldn't see anything in curvilinear, one that I might have to rely on some other form of imaging that may or may not be available to me at that moment, right? So it's either going to delay things or I just can't get it. And I can give a, a, a great degree of specificity to this patient and say, hey, look, we have a an IUP, right? We have the, the yolk sac, we have the fetal pole, and we have a heartbeat all about six weeks and one day things are looking positive for now you can follow up and um you know and see your obstetrician in a couple of days for follow-up right and so that this um technique we've found has provided significant utility in our patient population that's early on in pregnancy that doesn't have something that's visualized on the the uh, well visualized as say on the, um, the curvilinear transducer, right? Now, the question you're gonna ask is, is there literature on that one? And that really leads me to saying, yes, there is. And this is a study that we published uh, a handful of years ago, looking at this very question, right? So we published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, um, I think 2016 is when it was actually published. And um, so we basically tried to answer this question because this is a technique we've been using, we've been using for a while. Uh, and so we said, okay, in these patients where we can't quite see anything on our curvilinear, can we use that linear? And our really our goal here was reduce the rate of reliance on transvaginal ultrasound to detect an intrauterine pregnancy. That's it, right? I don't want to necessarily know all the, the, the details of the pregnancy, but can I identify that the intrauterine pregnancy is there, right? Because if I can do that, I can take a, a deep breath relax a little bit, and then work on some coordinating some follow-up for this patient. 
And so what we did is we enrolled uh, about 88 patients, seven of them met our exclusion criteria, and we, had a, we were left with about 81 patients. And the protocol was essentially, if you have complications in your first trimester, right? You had uh, vaginal pain or vaginal bleeding or abdominal pain, uh, and you were in your first trimester. And I think there's some other, um, you know, particular criteria, but they're trying to be broad or capture a broad se- uh, spectrum of these patients, right? You got a bedside ultrasound using the curve linear transducer. That's the CTA there, right? There's 81 patients there. If we found intrauterine in pregnancy, boom, we're done, right? In, in 51 or 54% of, or 54 of the 81 patients, right? We found that intrauterine pregnancy with, with curvilinear, right? There's only 27. So um, I don't know, roughly about a third of them that we didn't see the intrauterine pregnancy, right? And this is the cohort that I'm really concerned about. I'm really interested in, right? In this study. And so from there, we moved on from using the curvilinear transducer to looking with the linear transducer, right? Um, And so we had 27 patients who got a linear scan, right? And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen and a representative example, and this is a picture that we published in the article um, of that curvilinear and the sagittal orientation on top, transverse orientation on the bottom. You can see that gestational sac, right? But really nothing inside that sac that's visible with curvilinear, right? Um, So when we switched to the linear, and in nine of those 27, we actually saw evidence of an intrauterine pregnancy, right? Here you can see an example on the bottom right. So either, um, and, and we define IUP as anything yolk sac or more, right? So if we saw a yolk sac, if we saw a fetal pole, things like that, those were all considered intrauterine pregnancies, right? So in about a third of those patients who we couldn't see it with the curvilinear, we found it with the linear, right? And then the other 18, um, since we didn't see it on the intrauterine pre- with the linear transducer, they went on to get transvaginal ultrasound. Um, and of those 18, I thought this was really interesting. The majority of them didn't have any findings um, to confirm an IUP, even on the the transvaginal ultrasound. Only three of the ones that failed linear went on to have a TV and actually find the intrauterine pregnancy on the transvaginal ultrasound. Um, and that was the only way that we found it, right? So that really gives us some interesting numbers saying that we have about a 30% reduction in the need for transvaginal ultrasound in these patients where we can't really definitively identify the intrauterine pregnancy. And what we found experientially is that the place where this really, really works is those patients who are in that five to five and a half week mark, right, who have evidence of a gestational sac. Like if you see nothing, absolutely nothing, just an empty uterus, a nice you know, endometrial stripe, no sac, nothing, this is probably not going to be the highest yield patient for the linear transducer. You're probably still going to see nothing, right? Try it, but you're probably still see nothing. Where you're going to benefit is, do you have a gestational sac? And I can't quite see enough into that gestational sac to definitively call it, right? That's going to be the highest yield patient for the linear transducer, when you're doing this particular study, right? Now, some of the other data that we published in the article, basically um, top left or table one here shows those numbers just in tabular form. Um, Table two was interesting. So we wanted to know, okay, so linear transducer is very depth dependent, right? The farther down I get, the less the linear can help me just because it's a very shallow based probe to begin with. It gives me good resolution, but in the near field, not much in the far field, right? So we wanted to know, what was our, our depth, average, min, and max using the curve linear transducer for the patients that we scanned? And then what was it with the linear transducer, right? And so in patients that we scanned, the average depth in the curve linear, depth from the skin to the fetal yolk sac or fetal pole, so whatever the, the anterior most part was, um, the average depth was about 5.3 centimeters for the curve linear transducer. And for the linear transducer is about 3.9 centimeters, right? With the max depth of about eight centimeters for curve linear, and about four centimeters for linear, right? So this really shows that it's gonna be more of a shallow base thing, right? You can't necessarily say uh, that I'm gonna see a, you know, a structure that's eight, 10 centimeters down with the linear transducer. So it's gonna be somewhat limited based on the maternal body habitus, but it's certainly um, something that can be visualized in a lot of patients, right? A lot of patients have that depth, particularly with an antiverted uterus and like a um, not much adipose tissue in the abdominal wall the anterior abdominal wall, it's something that you can see um, decently decently readily available, right? The other thing that we wanted to know, and we presented here in that graph in the bottom left is, okay, so for those patients who end up getting the transvag ultrasound, right, who failed my protocol, what were their HCGs, right? Because the theory behind this is, okay, fine, I had 18 people that failed my curvilinear or my linear protocol, right? 
the vast majority of them, 15 of those 18, didn't have any findings in the uterus, right? Um, so the theory behind that is they were just too early to be seen no matter what we used, right? And we've certainly seen these patients where they come in, they say about four weeks long, you scan them, you have like two drops of fluid in the, uh, in the uterus, and then you get their quant back and it's like 300, right? And this is the scenario that we suspected, and it really kind of bore itself out in the patients who got transvag ultrasound, right? The vast majority of them had quants that were below, let's say, 2000 for sure, right? A lot of them were below 1000. There was one outlier that was really, really high, uh, but the vast majority of them were pretty low, indicating that, you know, what, you're probably pretty early on in pregnancy to begin with if we can't see anything by curvilinear and linear, and we have to go to transvag to get there, right? So that was kind of some interesting findings. So uh, the conclusion of our paper was essentially that the trans um, abdominal use of the linear transducer was led to a significant reduction in the need to do transvaginal ultrasound. And our, in our population was about 30% reduction uh, in the use of the need to use transvaginal ultrasound uh, in these patients, which does a number of things, right? If you think about it, it's very practically. Number one, it speeds up your study, right? You're in the room, you're doing it at the bedside. Right? You can get it done in a couple of minutes, as opposed to if you're going to do the transvag yourself, going to get the, the equipment, hooking it up, start putting the probe cover on, getting it in, get your images, pull it out, doing all the disinfection. It saves you a ton of time. Uh, it also saves the patient time if you don't have to go down to get advanced diagnostic imaging uh, in a radiology suite with, you know, with their transvaginal ultrasound. Um, you know, if you can find it and I positively identify it in the uterus uh, at the bedside. So there's a huge time reduction. Um, one of the other interesting things and I thought this was mostly amusing. In the original manuscript, I wrote that that patients would prefer this method because uh, patients would prefer not to get a transvaginal ultrasound, right? Um, and having never had one done myself, um, I can't say this experientially, uh, but I can imagine that it'd be rather uncomfortable to have a transvaginal ultrasound transducer um, inserted and, and manipulated to get the images that you need. Uh, and so I commented on that in the paper in one of the editorial reviews um, that we ended up having to take, we ended up taking that line out of the paper. One of the reviewers basically said that this is not true, that, you know, people don't mind having these ultrasounds performed. And so rather than fight the issue, I just said, fine, it's not critical to the paper. We'll just take that line out and we'll publish the paper anyway. Uh, and so we published the paper without that line, uh, without that additional reason. Now, I'm a firm believer that if we can accomplish our goal without going to the transvaginal ultrasound, that patients will be a lot happier with us, right? Um, anecdotally, I've asked some patients and like, yeah, and their responses are, are consistent with my, my presumption, right? However, to the credit, the reviewer's credit, if you look up in the literature, there's one, pub one published paper that is basically uh, women's impression of transvaginal ultrasound. And it basically was consistent with that reviewer said that they don't mind. Um, take that for whatever it's worth. Um, it's a, a minor point of the study. Um, but my point in bringing all this up is basically saying, this is a technique that we can easily do at the bedside, right? We can easily switch from one transducer to the other. There's a decent chance in the right population of patients that it's going to give you actionable uh, material that can save your patients some time, in my opinion, save your patients from discomfort, and really help you accomplish that goal of disposition to home um, and in OB follow-up to be able to help get, get your patient out of a place that they're uncomfortable and kind of help you move along patients from your other way, from your waiting room back into that room. So anyway, um, that's what I had to talk about today, just as a little bit of a recap as we kind of go on a wrap, wrap this back up. The, the big things that we want to take away from today is um, why scan, right? We want to locate that pregnancy. We want to make sure it's a viable pregnancy, and we want to make sure there's not any major complications that we need to worry about or intervene upon um, or prep the patient for in the emergency department. Number two, we talked a little bit about how to do this study, um, and we looked at the different findings early in pregnancy, the gestational sac, the yolk sac is the first definitive finding of pregnancy, followed by the fetal pole and things that you can measure on there being this gestational um, age with the, the crown rump length, the fetal heart rate, things like that. Um, and finally, we looked at this technique, this particular technique that can help us identify those challenging early first trimester pregnancies that will help us decrease the, the reliance on, on endocavitary or transvaginal ultrasound. And so with that said, we'll wrap things up here. Again, next week, we're going to talk a little bit more about that transvaginal ultrasound. So when you need to go there, right? What are you going to look for? What are you going to need to do? What are you going to need to, to find and assess? And how do you get the thing done? 
Uh, Sandy will be bringing that to us, and then I'll wrap things up in this this little module that we're doing uh, with some fetal diagnostic or fetal um, gestational age assessment throughout pregnancy, um, and that will get us kind of up into the Thanksgiving time. So, with that said, any questions on the material that we've talked about today? <laughs>